Praise the Lord and Christian greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. This is another opportunity that we have to be able to share with you concerning an issue that is upon the hearts and the minds of not just ourselves, of those that are on the panel with us, but also on the hearts and the minds of those that will be viewing. We want you to know that we heard you. And it is our desire to speak understanding, speak wisdom and speak knowledge and speak intellect into the situation so that when you address it in your own lives, you're able to respond um, intelligently. So I wanna say welcome to all of you who have joined us on tonight in our discussion on the race and social injustice conversation in the biracial and multiracial home. My husband shared with me, he said, that's a pretty long subject. I think it's, it's a pretty long subject, but I think it is an important one nevertheless. So I wanna share again, those of you that are coming on live, I wanna share with you that we're talking about, we're having the conversation on the race and social injustice conversation in the biracial and multiracial home. I want those of you that are viewing to participate feel free to ask questions, feel free to put comments in the comment box. If you have any questions, feel free to write them. And when you write them, we'll do our best to answer any questions that you may have. And we'll do our best also to comment or to share some of the comments that you have because I know that it is on your heart also. So I want you to begin to share. So before we begin, before we begin, let me introduce myself. I am your host. I am Krista Tyson. And this conversation is being sponsored by Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church of Youngstown, Ohio, and Christ Church Apostolic of Indianapolis, Indiana, where my husband, Suffolk and Bishop C. Sean Tyson, is the senior pastor of both churches. I want to introduce you to our awesome and as you will see, diverse panel. I'm going to share their names and they will share in a bit the representing roles that they play in this conversation. I hope that the panel that you see is the same panel on my screen. But if not, <laughs> I think you're able, I'm going to have our panelists when I say their names, if they will just uh, uh, wave their hand so that um, individuals will know that it is you. Okay. Our first panelist is, our first panelist is Pastor Locke P. Beecham Jr. He is of the pastor of Victory Christian Center, Liberty Campus of Ohio. So we want to welcome you Pastor Locke P. Beecham Jr. Our next guest is Mr. and Mrs. Art and Suzanne Ort. You can wave your hand of Ohio. Our next guest is um, Mrs. Stephanie Clemens. Stephanie Clements and her husband, maybe he'll join us and maybe not. We understand that he is um, a very busy young man, but we want him to know that we welcome him too, should he decide to come on. Our next guest is Miss Sierra Nelson. We're so glad to have Sierra Nelson with us. Sierra is a college student. And I think for all of the college students that are out there, um, the young people, I think this is going to prove to be a very interesting conversation, a good conversation for you. So I welcome you to join in with us, okay? I'm not gonna take up uh, too much more of the time um, because we plan on coming off by 8 p.m., but we have a whole lot to discuss. So let me say this, that I believe these last few months have magnified, magnified the ongoing issues in our nation of race and social injustice towards black and brown people. 
and the pushing of it under the rug has encouraged many to address it in their own way. And the addressing it in their own way has pushed them to address it in a negative way. And I wanna say this, I do not condone, I do not condone, Mount Calvary does not condone, Christ Church does not condone, our panelists, I know, do not condone, um, con do not condone violence, do not condone looting, none of that. There is a way that we can effectively um, display, address, and talk about what is on our hearts without us um, um, resorting to violence, without us resorting to violence. And I think it's an awesome opportunity for us to have this conversation because we just eulogized um, a, a, an important figure, uh, John Lewis, who stood for nonviolence. There's a way of getting it done without harming one another. But there is a conversation. There is a conversation that I believe needs to be had and understood from another perspective. What is the conversation in the biracial home? What is the conversation being had in the multiracial church? How is the pastor addressing the conversation in order to bring healing to the church in this season? I believe that our discussion tonight, I believe that our discussion tonight concerning the race, and when we talk about race, we're referring to uh, the color of the skin uh, being deemed significant when it comes to privilege. And when we talk about social injustice, we're referring to the freedom for all in all social areas. In dealing with this conversation in the biracial and multiracial home and church, I believe that this discussion will reach all levels and add to our understanding and healing process. One writer wrote this, it's time to transform habits of harm so we start healing what divides us. Racism is a heart disease. How we think and respond is at the core of racial suffering and racial healing. If we cannot think clearly mm, and respond wisely, we will continue to inflict damage. So let's begin to talk, shall we? So I wanna say to the panelists, welcome again. And to those that are watching us on the Facebook Live, I wanna say to you, welcome again. Okay, let's talk. How about that? I am going to I am going to ask each one of our panelists um, this same question to all of you. I want you to share share your biracial story, who you are as a couple, as a biracial child, as a pastor of a multiracial church. I'm going to first start with, um, I think is appropriate. I'm going to first start with Pastor Lock P. Beecham Jr who is the pastor of a multi-racial church. Welcome, Pastor Beecham. Thank You're you. up. Thank you, Pastor Krista. Well, you know, um, how, do you do you want to know how it is to uh, pastor a multi-racial church? Is that where you would like me to begin? Come on with it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a beautiful dynamic, and it's a dynamic that I have, honestly, since I stepped into this incredible assignment 12 years ago. It was what I prayed about. It was what I believe God had destined for me. I'd be remiss if I didn't begin with Psalm 133, which speaks to how beautiful and how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his head and onto the border of his Rome. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion and there the Lord has pronounced his blessing. The Lord's blessing is upon unity. And if we want to resemble kingdom, then that means we welcome all in. But we don't just welcome them in through the door. We speak to inclusion. Mm -hmm. There's anger in our America 
because there is a clear non-inclusion in every genre that makes up our America. It was Dr. King who said that rioting is the language of the unheard. It's mm -hmm. simply people that are angry. They're not doing it the right way. I don't condone it, as you said, Pastor Krista. But what I have practiced, not just talked about it, but mm -hmm. I have, by the grace of God, I have practiced inclusion. What that means is not just welcoming all backgrounds and races into the church, but actually activating these individuals in different areas and sectors of the church, including levels of leadership, worship, uh, whether it's greeting, whether it's parking lot, whether it's helps, uh, that is a true total inclusion as far as church is concerned. And one thing I've made sure, and God has helped me in 12 years, I don't preach a white Bible, I don't preach a black Bible. Mm -hmm. I don't preach an Asian Bible. I preach the word of God. Mm -hmm. That transforms hearts of plenty. Yes. And God has been very, very good to us. I believe that there is an attraction here. Let's be honest. I came to Victory Christian Center uh, right around January 2005. And one of the things that I looked for as an African-American man, I wanted to see if I was represented in this church. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, when I walked in, there weren't very many people who looked like me. Uh, be honest, that didn't sway me, Pastor Krista and panelists, it didn't sway me because of my relationship with my pastor. Mm -hmm. David yeah. Thomas happened to be my neighbor at that time. Wow. My love for him, my love for his wife. I didn't see color. I'd never had a white pastor. This mm -hmm. was a trip, everybody. My black and African-American friends that I grew up with are like, what are you doing going to a white man's church? I mean, what is that all about? I just said, you know, I got to go where God wants me in this season. I don't know what he's up to. Mm -hmm. He brought us to this place, though, where now I have the ability to pastor an incredible church of individuals who make up every background and every socioeconomic status. Jesus' ministry was built on inclusion. And shame on us if we would yeah. lead in a way that would bring harm or hindrance on anyone who would want to be a part of bottom line. This is a worship experience that's about Jesus. It's yes. not about individuals. It's not about people. It's not about any one man. It's not built upon that. It's built upon the foundation of who Jesus is. You, you said some. Um, you said some some poignant things. Um, the, the, the one thing that you said that rung out over everything that you said, and that was unity. Yes. It's difficult, and, and I'm, I'm getting ready to go to um, Art and Susie, and I know they fool, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm gonna say this, and that is that uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to get us to come together on one mind. Um, it, it, it's like there's a saying that you can put all the fellows in one ship going, supposedly going one direction, but they all will have different mindsets on how to get there. So then you'll have a divided boat and then you can put them in um, separate boats and them all trying to get to the same destination, but they're divided because they're all over the place. The one important thing that you said is unity. Can we, it reminds me of, um, I, I forgot the, the young man's name and I know I'm gonna get in trouble for forgetting his name. And that is, he made a statement, can we all just get along? <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway I, I, I think, well, yes, Rodney King, I'm sorry. I should not have forgot that. Oh, help me God. Okay, but anyway, all right, um, Art and Suzanne. Art and Suzanne, if you can share with us your story. You have to unmute. There you go. Yep. Uh, first, shout out Pastor Locke. Hey. We were uh -huh. there when you started. I okay. Remember, yeah, I remember we, we go to my, uh, Victory, uh, the Coitsville campus, and we were there when uh, Pastor Locke came first came on. Right. Wow. So, good to see you. Very cool. Yeah, he's got, the, he's got the DNA, the DNA of Victory, and that's, that's what it is. Okay. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what you want to know. I mean, we could share how we met. We could go into that. Right. Um, 
I, I want you to share how you met because in, yeah. in a little bit, um, I want you to begin to share. Um, we talked about um, uh, some issues even within that come up in the conversations that, that come up in your home. I want you to share right now your story. Okay. Okay. Well, I grew up in Canfield and if anybody here knows Canfield, Canfield's pretty, it's pretty white bread. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the suburbs. And I, I tell the story, I think we had two black people um, my entire time in high school, one of them was adopted. So really we had one black family in Canfield growing up. So I was not exposed to um, black people really at all. Um, you know, we're nice, people are nice there. I know the reputation Canfield has, but it just, it doesn't have that exposure. So I was always rebellious. Um, I felt stifled by that community. It was just, it just, it didn't, I was not comfortable there. So in my own way, I was always rebellious and trying to break the bands and trying to learn new things and get outside that box. Um, and I think that's what exposed me or opened me up to someone like um, Susie coming along. So, you know, I went through high school, I went through college, you know, you do all those things you're supposed to do, but I just couldn't see following the traditional path of, you know, you get married, you have two kids, you have a dog, the white picket, that whole thing. That just, that never appealed to me. So long story short, I get a job. Um, I'm working as an outside sales rep. And I always tell the story. I walk into um, this account where Suze was the receptionist. And I literally walked in and she smiled at me. And I mean, I just, I was done. That, that was it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it took a long time for us together to get together. And we could talk more about that, you know, as, as you see fit. Um, but in the end, I truly, I can't see my life being any different, you know, with her in the mix. So no pun intended, but. In the mix. <laughs> So that's a little bit about my background and then, you know, Suze can share her background. And... Well, I, I will say in, in comment to what Pastor Locke was talking about, I do see color. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually said to Art, I, I said, you know, I don't want anybody to look at me and say that they don't see color because I don't want you to be blind to my color. Mm -hmm. I want you to see it and love it and appreciate it. I know what you're saying, Pastor Locke. I, I do know what you're saying. <laughs> what you're saying is that that didn't matter. There was so much love. Sure. And we felt the same way being at Victory. I mean, the love that, you know, just overflows is unbelievable. But um, the kindness in this man was, mm -hmm. you know, what was so important to me. And I just... I remembered seeing him that first day and thought, I want to be a part of this guy. I want to know him. That's that's what I wanted. I wanted to know him. So um, that was a big deal. And and that was, you know, when he came and he pulled the window open, I, I pulled the window open. I was the receptionist sitting below answering the phone. And, um, and he pulled the window open. He walked up. He was bodybuilding at the time with a banana under his arm. Um, a yogurt cup, a, a yogurt and a spoon. And, and he came and he started talking to me. I thought, I was thinking, who is this guy? You know, so, and that began our journey. <laughs> I, I'm, I, you know what? I, I, I'm intrigued already. <laughs> and we're going to dig a little further because what I don't, what I don't want, um, individuals that are are that are are watching i uh -huh. don't want them to think that um that's the end of the story mm -hmm. it, we met we smiled we had a banana <laughs> and some yogurt and a spoon <laughs> and happily along we went and, and there was no more issues and we ain't got no problems and and we we just Pulling up daisies Happy and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yes, we get ready to share that in a minute. In, yeah. in a minute. Uh, so stay with us. Uh, um, <laughs> Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie. I want Stephanie Clemens to share with us. Stephanie, share uh, your story with us. Okay, so my husband and I 
uh, he, we met in college at cheer camp. <laughs> so um, a little background about me. I grew up in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I would say where I went to school, uh, Lafayette, Jeff, very, very diverse. So I always grew up, you know, being friends with, you know, African Americans, you know, there were Asians at my school, Indians, Hispanics. So I was, you know, growing up always surrounded by that. So I never really thought any differently. I'm like, oh, these are just my friends, you know, they, I grew up with them. Obviously, I know everyone grows up with different backgrounds. That's just how I was raised, but I was also raised not to, you know, judge people based on, you know, what they have, what they look like and things like that. So um, up until recently, um, you know, me and my husband really just started talking more about, you know, kind of what's going on with everything arising because we do have three biracial children. So, and they're getting to that point where we do have to start talking to them about things and just kind of navigating those conversations. So that's a little bit about us and where I, where I came from. Thank you so much, Sister Stephanie. And I, I, I know, and uh, we, as we shared before, we wanted Sister Stephanie, her husband to come on with us, but her, her husband, of course, is not able to be on with us right now. And Stephanie is married to a, a black man. Um, and of course, uh, she would share, there's several conversations that they have and things that they have been vocal about. I want to um, introduce you to Sierra. Sierra, I want Sierra to share her story before we dig into the conversation. Sierra. Okay, so um, I'm originally from California. Um, my mother is white and my father is black. Um, I feel like I can't really narrow it down to like which, which part of my life is affected by race. I kind of feel like my entire life is affected by race. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I went to Clark Atlanta University. I actually just graduated last year, uh, but I am still a college in college because I'm um, studying chiropractic now, but my original degree was in psychology, but yeah. Welcome to you, Sierra. We're glad to have you. Uh, Sierra is going to be very effective in reaching our um, uh, college students. I, I wanna, the first question to all of you, I want you to talk about, talk about the impact of your, um, of your biracial, either marriage or uh, um, your biracial, for lack of a better word, uh, life, um, talk about, and, and even in the church, talk about how this has um, had an effect either upon your marriage or even upon your life or even in the church. Now, when I say effect, I don't necessarily mean that it is a negative effect. Um, it can be effect to the point where now there's much more conversation um, or that there are memories of things that, that has happened um, that at first you kind of, okay, well, let's, let's move on through this until now uh, it, it, things are, are really starting to, uh, uh, to light up or you're really starting to see things. I want to start with Sierra first. Sierra, come on, Sierra. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I think I've always been very vocal about racial issues in general it's like when you're growing up there's really no way to avoid it I feel like when you're mixed with other things and you're like say if you're black and like Latino or black and Asian you might be allowed to be able to go between both worlds easier whereas like being black and white is like divisive in itself and they're not allowed to coexist together ever um, and I think a lot of my experience also has to do with how I look. Um, there's a lot of biracial people who look more black and their experience is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely 
have a privilege already. So we'll start off with, I already have a privilege and then I'm also just affected already. Um, I would say positive things that I'm realizing um, that I got to get was my mom always encouraging me that I'm black. Um, it may sound like such, such a small thing, um, but the world constantly told me I wasn't black. I'm not allowed to be black. I'm also not allowed to be white. I'm wow. just allowed to be in my separate category. And that's just kind of what it is. Like if you look at um, the testing that you have to do in school, mm -hmm. it tells you to check one box, one box that applies. Mm -hmm. But the how do, like then it's like, oh, I'm picking my dad or I'm picking my mom. Mm -hmm. So my mom was like, scribble both, just scribble both all the time. And like, she just told me like, anybody trying to put me in a box, like I'm not, I'm both, I can be both at the same time and not listening. So um, a lot of the foundation is home. And if I feel like one of the most important things to talk about is race, because especially in a biracial home, because if you don't, then you're allowing the world to teach them. And that's totally not where we need to learn wow. things <laughs> wow. in the media. Um, and I would say something that it really stimulated because my, my fiance is black. So he's not, I'm sure down the line, mixture somewhere, but you know, for now, no mixture. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a lot, also a lot of conversations with him about certain things to say in the house because it leads a complex when you put everybody in boxes. Mm -hmm. So if all white people are bad and all this and all that, then you lead with other complexes our kids will have because to him and to the world, our kids will not be biracial. They'll just be black. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't discount that their grandma is white. So it's like a lot of different stimulating conversations um I also went to an HBCU so I'm very like radical and a lot of people <laughs> like they they don't really understand that um so we get into like a lot of the idea of race is just a concept and it's just a tool that is used to be divisive but I think a lot of people aren't ready for that conversation mm -hmm. um I think a lot of people um even for like having a lot of conversations with my mom that like whiteness isn't real. It's mm -hmm. not real, it's a made up thing. Um, you know, we're Irish, Scottish and German. You know, whiteness is this idea of control and it's not, and I feel bad because a lot of white people have like, that's white culture, but what is white culture and what are you clinging to? Wow. Because that's not like people's essence, mm -hmm. so. There's a lot of conversations that's been just, it's just daily, it's just daily. <laughs> Sierra, you opened up a, 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 a wealth of stuff. We can take, we can take just one of those things that you said and we can really go. Uh, um, just the one thing that you said about there, there is no such thing. I, I, I mean, Wait, wait a minute. So, and then you can't, you can't put anybody in any one box. So it is, and honey, you got me on the, the circle in both boxes. I mean, just scribble the whole thing, just all of it. And look, <laughs> honey. Uh, okay, okay, we 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 moving, we moving. Uh, um, Art and Suzanne, come on, come on. Uh, come on, tell us what, um, describe the impact, the impact that it's had up on even uh, your marriage that it's had up on um, in, in, in your home. Well, let me just say that art is more black than me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, no, I'm not kidding. She just said HSBC or something. HBC, yeah. and, and I didn't know what it was. Okay, but that. <laughs> That's, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Okay, so, right. Woo. So it's all getting bubbled up now. Come on. So I'm from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And like I've described, you know, in times past, I was raised by parents who were not affected by what happened in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Jamaica is a different place. 
-hmm. we did not have white bathrooms, colored oh. bathrooms. Okay, we we were not. It, my parents were not exposed to that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I wasn't raised with parents who expressed innuendos or, you know, different things that you might say about another culture or warnings or anything like that. I, so I can't conjure that up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I say to my friends from time to time, and we had this conversation on Monday, um, and so when I walk into a room, my friends um, may walk into a room and look for another Black person, as African Americans, you know, might look for another Black person to feel comfortable. Yeah, like Pastor Locke said, you know, I'm looking around. I mean, where are we at? For me, it doesn't matter and did not matter. So for me, I wasn't affected. I felt just as entitled as anybody else walking into a room. And so I took my place and I owned my place and, and that was that. And so, you know, when I say art is, is I mean, he introduced me to so many black movies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pastor Locke. He said, that's a shame, girl. Yeah, I mean, he is so knowledgeable you know and he he you know he digs into that stuff and so mm -hmm. you know i've learned a lot from him and and then now you know with all of what's going on boy it's really been a a, a bit of a wake up call mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. for me not that i'm deaf dumb or blind but you know to oh to 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 realize, because as a Jamaican, you know, you, you come with a certain sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Jamaicans, Africans, you know, Caribbean people, we come with a certain sense of pride. And so, you know, when you look around and you're like, who the heck are these people to think that they can treat people like this? Mm -hmm. Do you do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, so that has been, you know, my take now. Um, in, in, I feel like you guys are joining into the conversation that we have always had, you know, mm -hmm. in, in our home more so now than we, we had been, but, um, you know, it's something that we, we have more, definitely have more conversations about it now. Um, you know, I have sat and watched um, the coverage of the different programs or the different uh, news medias and cried. I mean, mm. just hurt and in and crying where he has to hold me. And, you know, because I just cannot understand. I don't understand. I'm thinking, you know, yeah, I feel the way I do about being me and being black. I, I, you know, it's a fantastic thing. Why would people treat other people like this? And and I don't want to go on onto a rant, but um, that's my part. Yeah. So, and this, you know, since we've been married, we've just been very open about. I mean, we obviously are different, but we recognize it. We embrace yeah. it. We've never worn it as a badge or we've never, it's not something that bothers us. Right, I mean, we're all. aware of it. And sometimes we're not aware of it when we are with people or we're until somebody may point it out. And then it's sort of a, oh, oh yeah. Um, but these conversations about differences and races and what she's talking about now, I mean, we've talked about it over the years. I think what's changed lately is it's just, it's heightened. And like she said, it's gotten a lot deeper. And from my point of view, um, what's happened in the circles in which I run, you know, my family and, and whatnot who are predominantly white. I've always known a lot of the people in those circles who they're just these undertones. They call that uh, the microaggressions. I'm very familiar with what those are. I'm well versed on what those are and I know them when they're coming. But what's <laughs> changed right. with me lately is, and not that I've not been outspoken about it, but they're usually more overt. So somebody throws out the N-word, I'm gonna call you on it right then and there. Um, 
But when these microaggressions come out, I'm learning to deal with these on a different level. And so I need to address it then and there and have that conversation, even with people who are very close to me, who may not be overtly racist, but may have those, those fears and those prejudices and those, those biases that ultimately manifest in you know, racist mm -hmm. behavior. So, and that was learned. I I do believe that was learned. Yeah. Uh, because tell them about your experience. Well, so the first time the first time I had to deal with this was <laughs> when I was at work, and where I work, we're a little further south than where we are now. Um, the first time I heard someone say the N word in my presence, it was one of those. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Because I knew I had to deal with it. I couldn't not <laughs> say anything. So when I approached the guy, I told him, you know, don't do that. It's wrong. And my, my comment was, my wife is black. So I go home and I tell my wife, I tell Suze that I did this. I'm, you know, feeling okay. She says, no, that's not good. And I'm like, what? She said, no, it's just wrong, period. Don't bring me into that conversation. Right. So that was a wake up call for me that, oh, you know, it's like, I got it, you know, moving forward now, I don't bring her, I mean, it's just wrong, flat out wrong, and I'm going to call him on it. I had the best of intentions. I knew I had to deal with it. I made an attempt. And I think that's my point is, even as, as, as white people, in we just got to try, you know, it's wrong, do something. You may stumble, you may fall, you may get smacked down, but do something. Say something. But she's very good about that. I mean, if I'm wrong, she's going to call me on it, you know? So I think that dynamic and even more so now, we're just really learning how to navigate um, the culture in which we live now because it's just everything is so heightened and these conversations are taking place more and more, which I think is a great, uh, it, obviously it needs yeah, to happen. So I think and, and our relationship has sort of primed us. And I think at this point in time, we're a little more ready you know, for some of these harder conversations. And I appreciate you for sharing that, um, Art and Susie. And I'm going to come back in a little bit, Susie, because I want you to explain what you mean by it, it, it just didn't matter. I understand you're Jamaican and you made a statement oh. about uh, it, it just didn't matter. Now, wait a minute, I'm going to call you on that one. You had to explain that one right there. But I, I want to say this, and that is... Um, uh, uh, to art, and, and and that is that in the um, biracial uh, relationships, um, I think it is important um, what you just said, and that is for um, one race or another in the marriage to address when it is coming towards your way, when there is a statement made about um, your companion who may not be your race and it's talked about, it's important that we speak out and say something against it, not just because um, we're married to that race, but because it's right. And I think if inside of biracial uh, relationships that they understood this, and that is that we begin with or, or part of the, uh, the, the, the healing of the correction is address it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we, sometimes we can be so afraid of, okay, I'm afraid I'm going to get a backlash. Uh, somebody's going to say something about me. Uh, now I'm going to be on uh, uh, the negative list and all this kind of stuff. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going, look, I'm in my own little box. I'm happy. I'm going on about my business. Y'all say what y'all want to say. But uh, 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 until there is an understanding within us that we have a responsibility to address some things, mm -hmm. then it will remain. We've been ignoring stuff for too long. Right. And now here it is in our face and we can't afford to continue to ignore it. Oh, okay, Stephanie. Stephanie, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you, honey. I need you to, to talk about the impact that it has had, uh, 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 the impact that it has had upon your relationship, your marriage, or how you address it. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it necessarily has a negative impact uh, because it's something I've always been aware of. She wants to voice her concerns too. She's uh, got some good ones. <laughs> um, it's something I've always been aware of, especially even growing up. So even though I was in a very diverse school, um, 
there was still another part of town that was very country and um so you experience it there um and you see it there um and i remember the first time actually that i can recall and remember um you know kind of experience in it i was um at my cousin's house they're like my second cousins or something of that nature um and we were at a basketball game that happened at that school that's out in the country um and I was taking one of my black friends home well we stopped at my cousin's house and we were playing with my playing call of duty or some video game um and my cousin that was our age um in his room and so the adults that were out there were asking my dad why they are, why he's letting me hang out with that N word. So I experienced that, you know, that was my first time and I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, so it was something I was already, I was aware of, but then that was the first time I actually like overtly heard it from somebody that I knew. Um, so since I've always been aware of it, um, and my husband I know has experienced it throughout his life, um, you know, it's something we've always talked about. So for us right now, this has really just been bringing up conversations of what are we going to tell our children? Yeah. Um, for me, my biggest thing is I have a son who is definitely darker skinned. Our daughters are a little more fair skinned, as you can tell. Um, and my biggest fear when explaining this to my son, because he's seen, he's going to be seen as a, a black man by society. Mm -hmm. How do I explain to him that people who look like mommy will hate him because he, is, he looks like daddy? Wow. Mm. That's been my biggest struggle and impact is as a mother more than anything. Mm. I, you know what, Stephanie? I'm gonna say this and that is that I feel with you. I feel with you in the challenge that uh, black families already have trying to have the conversation with their black sons of what they could possibly run into and then to now have a conversation that the mother is white and her son is um, seen as black and you're trying to have this conversation with your son and, and she made it a poignant and I, I, I'm taken back that uh, now you have to tell him that somebody that looks like mommy um, may come against you negatively. How do you have, that's a whole conversation in itself. How do you have this conversation with that child to tell him that um, mommy's not against you and, uh, 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 but you have to, oh, that's a conversation. I I'm gonna get back to you in a minute, Sierra, because I think you have something to share, Sierra, on, on the conversations in the home uh, uh, of, of parents having to, to uh, address that conversation with you. Uh, but, but before we come back to you, Sierra, because that's, that's a good question right there, because we have a lot that are uh, watching us on Facebook that are having to have these conversations with their children and not really clear on, okay, what do I say? But uh, Pastor, Pastor Beecham, I want to come to you because I want you to talk about the impact that it's had in your multiracial church. What have you had to say? What things have you had to address? Uh, uh, okay, Pastor Beecham. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm so I'm blown away by all of these beautiful conversations from the panelists. Uh, yes. I feel like I'm learning so much uh, from them as I'm just, I'm just, I'm very intrigued by their experiences 
because these individuals are living um, this today. You know, I'm experiencing it just in a pastoral place, but you know, so much of even what I'm doing today as a pastor, honestly, I have a new perspective and I have new eyes simply because Jesus changed my life. Uh, you know, I didn't always have the perspective that I have right now. You know, I grew up in a home where, you know, my father's from the South, he's from Alabama. Mm -hmm. And um, he had some horrible experiences with racial uh, integration and white bathrooms, black bathrooms, boy this, boy that. And, um, and so I grew up, you know, with that common knowledge. And so there was a, a slant. It really was, you know, bottom line, Jesus changed my heart, my life, but I still live in reality. Yes. And so what I have to do is I have to do my best to build bridges between the cultures that exist, not only within our church, but in the world that our church has to live in. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, folk are only at church. Now we in COVID now, but folk are only in church once, maybe twice a week, but they got to live in the real world. So That's we can right. paint this picture as though, you know, everybody's going to accept you because, you know, you're God's child. I mean, I wish the world was that perfect, but right. it just won't work like that. Uh, we got to speak the truth, you know, <laughs> you know, we have to seek the first to be, uh, you know, to understand rather than to be understood. So I'm doing my best to just build bridges between uh, our congregants and speaking from from the worlds that they live in and understanding that, hey, I know we love Jesus, but you're experiencing some things that I'm not. Yes. And if you are willing to understand uh, how my life is shaped and how I am looked at and how I am disrespected, dishonored uh, when it comes to certain venues and places and such, then I think that we can have vital conversations. I think what we're living in today in the church and within our world is a reality check. Mm -hmm. We were nowhere near as far advanced as we thought we were when it comes to any level of true unity. We got a long way to go, but I'm doing my best as a pastor and to me, the, the greatest bridge that you can build is Jesus. It's, yes. It starts there. We got to start there and we have to look at how Jesus uh, did his best in his lifetime in 33 years to build bridges between, you know, all of the racial uh, aspects that existed. And uh, we're trying to build upon that uh, even to this day. Thank you. And, and Pastor Beecher, you, I want to say this, that you represent um, you represent many pastors um, that are in the same uh, position that you're in and also just the comments that have come up, the issues that have been addressed right here on this panel may be something that they never even thought about but now here they are, it's opened their eyes to, okay, this thing keeps sprouting. It keeps sprouting. Here's an issue over here. Wait a minute. I've just been addressing the fact that uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a multiracial, there is a, a, a biracial couples here, but I haven't addressed the fact, okay, how can they have these conversations with their children and it just all the doors that are that are opening up, that are continuing to open up. Uh, 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 now we have to, as pastors, you have to look at it from another perspective. Wait a minute, now I'm going to have to go back to the Bible to find out what does the Bible have to say about how to address this with the children? How, to, how can I, as a pastor, come down to uh, uh, the language of a child? to help that child understand uh, uh, this is what, uh -huh. and, and to help a parent, uh, um, uh, uh, helping them to get through this phase. I'm gonna tell you, this whole pandemic, and I think Sierra is gonna be able to help us. I think this whole pandemic has opened up some stuff that we may have pushed to the background that we have not addressed, and now it is, okay, address it. Because if you don't address it, you're going to drown. If you don't address it, you're going to have some angry people because it has put a voice 
It's put a voice to people. And now they're saying, okay, this is what I've been trying to say. Now we find out that it's not only their voice that has been, uh, 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 that has been concerned about the issue, but it's several voices. And now all the voices are talking. And it kind of reminds me of, of that movie. Uh, I don't know if it was Liar Liar, where he played God. Uh, uh, the guy played God. And he was on, uh, uh, Susie, you, Bruce Almighty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bruce Almighty he tried to play God. And he was on the... Um, on the computer and he was trying to answer everybody because all the questions, all the stuff kept coming and coming and coming. So he gave everybody the same answer. <laughs> That's not working no more. Ain't working no more. So Sierra, Sierra, I'm coming back to you. Sierra, I need you to talk about the conversation, the conversation that has been had and that is being had in the biracial home. And oh. maybe you can help uh, sister or give some, uh, some, uh, insight to Sister Stephanie, and also give some insight to the Pastor Beecham. And I know Art and Susie are raising uh, 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 grandchildren too. Maybe we can give some insight. Come on, Sierra, help us out. Okay. Um, I think the most important thing that parents can do is educating themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's like the the starting point. Is you know you have to educate yourself on. It's not just white people that hate black people in this mm -hmm. country. There's everybody plays a part in this society that affects black people. So I, I understand where you're coming from as far as the being scared that your son, you know, is going to identify you with those people. But I think the first thing you need to do is separate yourself from those people. Like you, you are white, but you're not like them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you know, releasing from that fear already is a step because my mom is always like. The, I'm not, it was never like my people hate your people. It was mm -hmm. like, there's people that don't like black people. And that's how the world works is past America is just how the globe works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of young, uh, I'm Pastor Locke. I think he talked about his father growing up in the South. And I know a lot of black men got to sit down and watch Roots like when they're five. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is scary because we think about our kids as these, oh, these pure spirits, but it's like, it's better that the, they hear about it from you and understand that they can come talk to you when they run into these situations than going out and learning in the world that, oh, you think everybody likes me, but then it's um, a person of color police officer that still treats you that way because they play into that system too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the first step is definitely reading, reading, reading this society this this education system does not teach us anything mm. just like how i believe um miss susie was talking about she didn't even she didn't even grow up like that so it's a constant way that the world divides even black people from each other she's jamaican i'm african-american mm. that's why everybody's just start i'm black because that includes all of us we're all black and we all get treated a similar way in different places, we just had a different stop on the boat. And that's mm -hmm. all that means. Um, wow. So I, yeah. And then, you know, encouraging also, if you know that you live in a space that isn't diverse, including your children in spaces where there is diversity, where there are other black people that have different ways of life or look at the world differently, because then it leads your kids to be able to open their own doors. You know, people will put your son in a, he's just a black man, but he's not just a black man. He could be whatever he wants to be, but the world is very, he's going to have to play sports or he's going to have to be a rapper. Wow. Um, so I think the first step is like, we got to read books that they don't give us. And we got to talk to, you know, if, even if you go to my, I learned my first semester at my HBCU was like, my whole world got flipped upside down. Everything is a lie. <laughs> that's like the, wow. first thing, the first thing that you learn is like everything is a lie. So that's like, and then, you know, I believe um, Art was also talking about microaggressions and like that's, there's a whole plethora of microaggressions and just straight aggressiveness that we don't even know because we're not paying attention to the system that's at play. So education, number one, that's, that's my... <laughs> Wow, 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 wow. Look, look, look. 
I want to do this. We might have to come together again because we might have to continue this conversation because this conversation, I believe, is enlightening. But what I want to do just before we just before we close, we only have a few more a few more moments. But I want to say this. I want first of all, Susie, I'm coming back for you. You're going to have to respond to what you said. And then I want to come to each one again. I want you to just uh, talk briefly or just share um, a conversation that is being had in your home even now. Um, so others that have to have conversations know that they're not alone and how um, it is being addressed. Understanding that the conversation is being had. But what does the conversation look like? Are you with me? Um, and, and what does the conversation look like in the church, in the multiracial church? So Susie, here you go. You, you, got, a, you got a few seconds to defend yourself, honey. Right. So when I said it, it doesn't or it didn't matter, what didn't matter was my comfort level being based on the fact that I was the only person in the room that was black. Um, yes, it matters. It definitely matters. I mean, you know, this is a, a multiracial country and we should reflect that. We definitely should. Um, however, my comfort level in a room, as I have always taught my daughter, who looks like you, Sierra, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I have always said, when you walk into a room, it is an opportunity to teach. Mm. It's an opportunity to teach. So when I walk into a room as a black person in a multi in, in a you know, multi-white setting, I must blow your mind because I know that your perception is what you saw on, on TV. Mm -hmm. So I must teach, um, you know, uh, we are all uh, teachers of God. We are all teachers of God because to teach is to demonstrate and God is love. We're all demonstrators of love. Mm -hmm. And so when I walk into a room, that has to be my priority. Mm -hmm. You know, that you don't look at me and say, well, you know, that's not what they are. Or, or, you know, you're typically supposed to be A, B, or C. Learning experience. The next thing is that we have to be careful as Black people. Now, I'm going to touch on something a, a, a little bit different. We have to be careful what we look for when we walk into a room. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we walk into a room expecting the antagonism. I must say, for me, it's been minimal. If, if at all, I, you know, I said to Art the other day, hey, I've never been followed in a store in 41 years. He said, uh, yes, you have. <laughs> you just didn't know it. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it's not something I take note of. Now, one might say, well, you're being ignorant. You're not being aware. You're not being, listen, there are times I call myself the happy idiot because I am in a place of understanding who I am as a person. And I think, you know, the word of God says, seek and, and you'll find, I'm not saying that we're all looking for it when it happens, please get that, you know, clearly. But I will give you a quick experience before, um, you know, and wrap it up. Monday, because I'm now heightened, my sensitivity is now heightened. Yes. I'm all, you know, do we matter as black people? You know, kind of thing. Okay, so I'm driving down Wick Avenue and there's this white kid in a truck in front of me and on his, uh, his side rear view, he had a camera. So, you know, I'm sitting in the back there, I'm going, wait, is he taking a picture of me? What is going on? The world is going crazy. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I am, I'm right at the light by St. Vincent de Paul or what used to be because they're building a dormitory um, for YSU, like right over there. And the guys are over there on the scaffolding. Okay. So we left that light and we went to Commerce Street. Well, you know, I'm thinking, oh, prior to yes. leaving the light, yes. he 
had his fist out the window and he was he was shouting something and so um i thought oh, wait a minute what the heck is this i mean race racist just like straight up <laughs> So I, I, you know, we drive to, he drives to uh, Commerce and, uh, and whatever, and Wick Avenue. And I was making a left, but I couldn't help myself because I talked to everybody. So I pulled in the, in the uh, lane next to him, rolled my window down and said, well, you're happy today. And he goes, those are my paint buddies. <laughs> He was taking pictures of his, buddies. of his buddies on the scaffolding. Shouting to them. Shouting to them. Uh, we have to be careful, people. We have to be careful. We have to, we cannot make a single move without Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful. And therefore, here I was. <laughs> making assumptions you know I was ready to be you know, heightened we have to be careful it had nothing to do with me my point is if you look for it you will find it so that aspect of it all we really have to take a second look and that, that that's my story <laughs> I, I, art 30 seconds or less a conversation had in your home being had uh, in your home. You no, know, we thought about that. It's really hard. We do. We talk about. We actually have um, jokes, and we we play off the race card all the time in a, <laughs> with in, each other in a healthy manner. Sometimes it puts people off. Yeah. So they're like, be, "Should I laugh? Should we laugh?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think what's changed is we're, we're we're going deeper. My whole approach, um, and I've learned. I can't tell you how much I've learned from her. Um, like for example, we're raising grandkids. And there's things I do, I let them just go wild. I let them, you know, whatever. In the store, they ride in the shopping cart. I mean, this is stuff that I'm used to growing up. She'll sometimes stop me and she'll point out, but they're black. Chill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at first I'm put off. I'm like, yeah, I, but I can't relate to that. But I have to put myself aside and I have to really try to understand where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. I think that's the dynamic um, that comes in this is it's not always my way. It's not always her way. And it's not always black and white right. sometimes it's not even about race it's about um, principles sometimes. Wow. But so much from her and my whole thing is I just I, I always try to be in a, in a learning state of mind and these I love these conversations these are fantastic wow I wow in these and then in the in the in the world in which I work in the circles in which I run I am now better educated and prepared to to speak um, like, you know, Sierra had said, or like you had said, with facts, with intelligence, with wisdom, mm -hmm. instead of getting all worked up and emotional, which is not how I operate. You know, I've now got got these experiences, which are great, which turn into stories, which I can share with people, which is where it always hits home. So I, this is this is fantastic. Wow. Um, one more tiny point with regards to, um, you know, in church. I will say this, um, we have been, you know, a little bit hesitant, just wondering, do we matter um, mm -hmm. in the church setting? And we know, you know, our, our pastor is, you know, that that's not his, his voice, right. but the pew, you know, there are people in the pew that you don't have control over. But I will say, as I shared with, uh, Sister Krista in, in times past, um, in this heightened sensitivity of, of racial injustice um, and crying for weeks, just, just crying and crying. One day I received a text from Art's brother's wife. One text that said, Susie, we love you. I've been thinking about you all this time, um, we, we care about you, we stand with you, hope you're doing well, blah, blah. I burst into tears. Wow. What are we doing as white Christians and reaching to our black brothers and vice versa? Are we, does it just stop at, oh, I'm praying for you for cancer? But there is this hesitation with talking about, I'm praying, you know, regarding these injustices 
they are not right. It's just mm -hmm. it, it's that sort of thing. But that has been, you know, and one of the aspects of our conversations, um, you know, just looking at how such a small gesture, a small gesture could have such a huge impact. I wow. have been talking about it for about a month now, every day. Wow. Wow. Uh, uh, just a small gesture uh, goes a long way. It does. Uh, Sister Stephanie, 30 seconds a conversation being had in your home concerning this race and social injustice? Um, I already hit on the big one that we've been having. Um, I guess another conversation, you know, that we've had, a lot of it pertains to our kids. Um, so we live in Carmel right now, uh, which mm -hmm. is a suburb of Indianapolis, um, predominantly white. And our son and daughter have been going to schools that are predominantly black. Mm -hmm. uh, so our fear right now that we've been talking about is when he goes to public school, um, not this coming year, but next year, you know, ending COVID obviously. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it's gone by 2021. <laughs> but um, him having a culture shock when yeah. he's there. Wow. Uh, uh, Pastor Beecham, you, 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 you're hearing that? that? That's another subject in and of itself. Yes, uh, the yes. children having a culture shock, biracial children having culture shock, going to one school system and then going to another. But Pastor Beecham, I'm going to leave you for last because yeah. I need you to, okay. Sierra, come on. What's the conversation? What's the conversation <laughs> in your home? Or that um, had in your home, younger or right now? Younger, right now. What individuals? Because I'm sure whatever the conversation was, younger is addressing people, is hitting people even now. Well, I think a lot of conversations I'm also having to have, um, especially getting married to somebody who is just black, mm -hmm. uh, realizing how many microaggressions I let slip by because I just care about people and don't want to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, or like I've said the conversation, but it's like people don't really, I'm also a woman, so mm -hmm. words are don't hold as much value all the time. So <laughs> you try to like say something, you know, and it's like, oh, joking. So now it's like, I'm getting to the point also in my adult life where now I'm getting married. I might be having kids soon. It's like, I got to be real selective about who's going to be around my energy, my children, wow. like who's going to be molding their minds and their idea of themselves. So we've been really focusing on like self-healing and, mm -hmm. um, you know, education. And just like, I think like Art said, like making sure, you know, we're constantly just learning and, you know, evolving ways that we need to think, speak and act for our future. And wow. So, yeah. that, that That's, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, Pastor Beecham, close us out on what's happening in the church, the conversations in the church. What can we do? What can we do? I think this, the same thing, honestly, that is happening in my home is happening within the church that I have the awesome privilege of pastoring, and that is uh, identity. Mm -hmm. I think through education, you know, I have two beautiful children at home uh, that go to predominantly white schools and mm -hmm. I am pouring into them who they are. Yes. They are learning from me who they are so that less is the influence mm -hmm. being surrounded around anyone who would say anything negative and or try to label them. Mm -hmm. they understand who they are because mom and dad tells them. Same thing in the church. Mm -hmm. in the church, I am telling our church family via online and in the house of who they are. Yes. God says they are. Yes. That I know uh, we fill out a uh, census, you know, on black, Asian, you know, but heaven ain't like that. Uh -uh. It is, there'll be no census there. No. God doesn't see us like that. God does not see color. We do, but he mm -hmm. doesn't. He's yes. omniscient, omniscient and omnipresent. He's sovereign. He is merciful. He is kind. He is ever loving and ever forgiving. And he forgives the most heinous crimes, Jesus. crimes that have ever hit the face of the earth. 
and we are trying to be more like Christ. So I'm letting our church know that you must gain an identity of who you are in Jesus. Yeah. Once you gain that identity, that lessens bigotry and hate because mm -hmm. bigotry and hate exists in the church. MLK said Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. We got it. We have a responsibility to break those color lines as best we can. Now, this moment in time does not help, but oftentimes God will give us a challenging situation so that we can press more into him. I think we've gotten too carnal, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. We got to press into what God is saying. We, we've, we've gotten too relaxed and now it's time to get back up on the proverbial wall and begin to address and face some things that will help to heal our nation, heal our world. This conversation has been awesome, has been awesome. It is not done, but we have to stop. I wanna thank you, our panel, and to you, our viewers, for sharing with us on this evening. And I want you to please, please feel free to sow a seed into one or both of these ministries, Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church, or Christ Church Apostolic, both are good grounds. And we look forward to sharing with you in more conversations that will heal. I wanna to say to our panelists, Art and Susie, Pastor Lock Beecham, Sierra and Stephanie, thank you so much for being so vulnerable to share with us your life and how we can help to heal this nation. God bless you, God keep you, and may heaven smile upon you and give you his peace. Let me pray and we will close. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity that you have given unto us to impart some piece of wisdom and knowledge into those that are watching and those that we'll see later in the replay. God, so that we can be healed within ourselves so that it can answer some questions that we have in our lives. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare and decree that this is done, that we are turning, hey God, we are shifting in the name of Jesus. Now God be glorified and your name be magnified in Jesus name, amen. Have a good rest and I'll talk with all of you at another time. God bless you, thank you, bye-bye.